joining us tonight. We really appreciate having you. My name is Elise Rosemary, and I'm a senior vice president here at ACAM. Um, tonight, we're going to be discussing effective budgeting, ensuring your property is financially sound. Um, joining with me tonight, I have two esteemed colleagues of mine. Avi Zanagirian, who is a CPA partner at Charnowski and Beer, and our very own Vice President of Finance, Megan Mooney, who is here with us from ACAM. Um, just to give you a little bit of their backgrounds, Ari is a partner at, and a CPA at Charnowski and Beer. He's been with Charnowski and Beer since 2007 and oversees the audit staff and is heavily involved in each client's audit process. Um, so thank you so much, Avi, for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. And then Miss Megan Mooney has been with us. She's been a vice president of finance for ACAM and has been um, in the industry for over 30 years. She can't just look at, but she has. Um, and she's overseen a large scale of different types of residential properties. And she's responsible for overseeing ACAM's financial operations for all our clients and spearheading the exciting time, which is budget season, which I know you like to get started early here at ACAMP. So thank you both for joining me tonight. All right, so tonight we are going to be discussing the goals of the annual budget, the budget process, what's new, additional things that are to consider. I know there are some of those this year. Um, ACAM's best practices and Avi's best practices. And then we'll do a question and answer at the end of this. So like, we generally do, we of course invite you to ask questions in your Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and we will answer them at the end. Um, and if you think of anything that we didn't cover tonight or you have any questions that are remaining, please feel free to email any one of us and we will get right back to you. So thank you so much. So let's kick it off with Avi. Can you tell us some goals of the budget season and the annual budget? I uh, sure can. Thank you, Lise. And thank you for uh, Megan. Uh, always enjoyable doing this topic with you this time of year. Um, so we, uh, what are the goals of the budget, right? What are we trying to accomplish here? Uh, for some of you that are joining us tonight, you may be your first go around with the budget. Um, you were coerced to join your board or you've been on the board for many years and uh, want to get a little bit more hands-on on the budget process this year. What are, what are we trying to do? So I always try to remind all of my clients uh, when they ask us about this and when we talk about the, the budget process is that we're not, we're not making a budget for a uh, Fortune 500 company here. Uh, it's a very simple process. There might be di different, inc a lot of intric intricacies based on the size of your building, right? A, a 10 unit building versus a 2000 unit property will have different uh, levels of complexity. Uh, but overall, the goal is the same. And the same is that we were trying to, we look at it as like a non for profit. Uh, you're trying to cover your expenses that you have and, and you project, which we'll talk about, um, which a lot of them are predictable. And we were able to kind of uh, look at them and, and benchmark them based on, on the pri prior years or other industry trends. Um, and then we want to see how could we cover those expenses with revenue, uh, right? With that common charges, maintenance, commercial, commercial income, um, you know, antenna income, sublet fees, et cetera. Um, and, and, therefore, and, and that will lead us to having a break-even budget. We're not for profit. We're not looking to make money here. Uh, it's not like the we make money and we're, we're paying out bonuses to the shareholders. Uh, so that's, that's, you know, that's goal number one. Um, we want to also, you know, we, uh, when you take that approach, sometimes you kind of forget about the future. You say, okay, I'm just going to look at this year and you're not going to have an eye out to the future. And there's always a piece of this, which we'll talk about too, about the capital planning, uh, and making sure that you're not doing something that will hurt you later on, even though in the, in the moment, it seems like the right thing to do. Um, and, and, and one of those things is, is not having a deficit. Don't put yourself in a position where you're not gonna have the revenues to cover your expenses um, and therefore uh, run a deficit and then have to borrow, take money from reserves and then, and then create this process that uh, a lot of buildings take many years to recover from. Um, you want to make sure also that you're that you're not losing money. The building should be uh, anything that is the building's expenses, right? You have real estate taxes, et cetera, bigger utilities. Uh, we want to make sure that are covered by maintenance. But if there are things that should be covered by shareholders um, or unit owners, for, uh, you know, whatever they may be, which we'll talk about, those should be covered. You know, those should be charged back. Make sure the building is not losing money. 
we're not letting, we're not giving, we're not paying for things for other, for other people that, um, that, uh, that, that shouldn't be paid for. And remember it is a, if you're in a co-op, it is a cooperative environment. If your condominium is an association environment, everyone's trying to share expenses that are shared in general. If there's something that's specific to an owner, um, uh, necessarily shouldn't, ne shouldn't necessarily be covered by everybody else. But again, obviously that's a, you know, that's the topic in and of itself. Um, and then, and lastly, is we just want to make sure, you know, the, the budget is a working document just because we set the budget on, you know, December 1st, we do a 2% increase on January 1 of 2023. We don't look at, we don't look at it again until next year. That's not, you know, that's not what the, pro the process is. The process is obviously you want to make sure that you're 90%, 95% accurate going into the year, but that means that you have to look at it every so often. So we'll talk about that as well. So again, just to, just to sum, sum it up, we want to treat the co-op and condo like a not-for-profit. We want to prepare for the future. We want we don't want a deficit. We want to make sure the building isn't losing money, making sure we have all aspects of that covered. And then also, uh, let's, not, let's make sure not to look at it once a year and, and look at it going forward. So hopefully with those goals in hand, we could, we could tackle that project tonight. Great. Thank you, Avi. So it's a working document. You're yes, it is. It's, not, it's like it's a Google Doc. Not. It's a Doc. Google Doc that everybody's in, and it, and it, and it's not just locked away and saved away till next year. Because budget could change because things it happen can. throughout the year, and yeah, you gotta prepare accordingly. Understood. Um, so, Megan, can we chat a little bit about the budget process and how you know you review expenses, etc. Sure. Um, yeah, in crafting a budget, um, there's a couple of things that are really important to do. Um, you want to set your assumptions up. Uh, you, we go to all of our industry professionals to get some basic, um, you know, benchmarks for each of those expenses. Uh, we'll go to an insurance person, for example, and get sort of a feel of what are uh, what kind of premium renewals are we seeing, what kind of increases. So we put together our um, those uh, assumptions ahead of time. Then we want to take a look at all of the items that have um, transpired during the year, uh, the income and, and expense side. We wanna make sure we do sort of an audit before Avi does his audit. We wanna make sure we internally review all of our income and expenses, um, make sure everything is in the right general ledger uh, code. Uh, we wanna make sure we keep operating and capital items in their appropriate places. Um, it really is a tool to set maintenance or, or common charges. So we wanna make sure we um, prepare those appropriately for our boards. Um, it is a team effort. We do present a draft to a board, but you wanna get the board, uh, their involvement in it because it really is part of a team effort to um, do this together. Um, we wanna make sure that, um, that we get the historical information from a couple of years in the budget as well. So we can see year over year what's going on and then the current year. This helps us set the basis for projecting what's gonna be the last couple of months of the year and then the year after. Um, we do also have to take into consideration, are there one-time things that have happened? If you've had a big leak for plumbing, you wanna make sure you don't necessarily build that in year after year, but take it into account, footnote it, um, things like that. 2020 was an exceptional year as well. We also had some interesting um, expenses. There were COVID expenses there, but on the flip side, there was a lot of vacancies everywhere. So you wanna take those, that into consideration as well when you're um, budgeting for things like uh, your utilities. You wanna make sure that you're not budgeting based off of solely a 2020 historical figure because that might be skewed um, a bit on the low side. Um, I think that's it on, on setting up the budget process. I have a question. Are you seeing an impact still from vacancies on the budget? You know, is it as prevalent as it was, you know, when COVID first hit? Are you starting to see kind of a little bit of levity with that? Yeah, most of that has seemed to even out. Um, I, I'm not seeing as many of the vacancies or any of savings, if, if you will, from, from that kind of information. If, if people were going to be permanently vacant, I think they've already tried to sell or have gotten out. So I, I do think that we're, we're pretty well um, trued up at, at, on that front. Got it. Okay, great. Thank you, Megan. 
Um, so let's discuss, you know, all sources of revenue. Avi, what can you talk us through that a little bit? Sure can. Um, so, so we have on the screen here, we have leases, interest income, um, and maintenance and common charges. So obviously you might ask yourself, ask yourself the question, why is maintenance on the bottom? Isn't that, isn't that the biggest item on the revenue? Uh, the answer is yes, it is, but it is the, it's like the plug number, right? Maintenance is what is, what's going to set, um, uh, what's going to cover what, what's going to make up for whatever you don't you don't have in other areas. So that's why we want to focus first on the areas, just like Megan was talking about, making sure you look at the predictable expenses, look at the uh, benchmark expenses um, and other maintenance areas. Right. Because obviously, you know, in a, in a year like Megan was saying, when you have COVID expenses or if let's say you have some plumbing leaks, you don't necessarily want to you want to identify that and i know that I mean, megan was talking about this with the gl coding um identifying non-recurring expenses and you know ne ne necessarily not budget for them the next year because hopefully they're they're non-recurring it's maybe a leak or something like that so the same thing is on the revenue end <clears throat> what revenue items were there last year and we want to try to be a little bit more conservative on that on that front so Going on to leases, commercial leases, I think when we had this, uh, we, we, we spoke about this the last couple of years um, because of COVID, uh, we were really advising our clients to be very conservative. And we saw a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of volatility on the, especially buildings with commercial space of just, you know, being able to benchmark. How do, how do you, how do you project a building is 25%, 20% of its revenue is commercial, but they know they're not collecting or they're not getting the escalations like they normally do. They're not getting <clears throat> the chargebacks. So they're late uh, They're whatever it may be. How do you do that? So I think it's, you know, I think it's, I think it's very more predictable now, like Megan was saying, I think people are in leases. Anyone that was, that was in a, in a vacancy, um, has has either left and it's been replaced. Obviously, not everything has been replaced. There are areas of the city that aren't as hot as others. Um, but when it comes to the leases, you have to be realistic um, because, again, if if you're not if you're not expecting to collect a hundred percent of the lease term, right? Don't you know? Don't budget for that, and because it's going to show a surplus. I just did a budget with another build a building, a fiscal year end, a July year end. They were showing that they were collecting all the commercial commercial revenue. And I was going over the board. I said, you know, you're showing a three hundred fifty thousand dollars surplus, which is great, but you 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 know you you haven't you haven't collected for this from this owner in eighteen months. You you got to put something in there for for not you know uncollectible amount. So when you know, thank God things have been better. But when you if you are a building that's in a situation where they're not getting all the money or the lease states, you know, like I was mentioning, you're getting the you're getting the monthly rent, but you're also going to get an escalation for real estate taxes. You're going to get a charge back for utilities and some other other escalations, maybe a fuel surcharge of some sort, and they're not paying those, then don't budget for them. Or if you do budget for them, have a little provision in there. Because again, if that money doesn't come in, where is it coming from? It's going to come from reserves. It's going to come from the, it's going to have to be plugged by maintenance and you're just going to put yourself in a bad position. So when you're looking at the leases, make sure that's there. Uh, in, addi in, addition, in addition to that, uh, look at your laundry leases. Uh, I, think, I think that's kind of even that a little bit, uh, Megan probably, you know, I know it could tell you a lot of the lease, a lot of the laundry leases were budgeted at, let's say $4,500 a month for a building because that was in their contract. But in the agreement, I'm sorry, not a contract, in the agreement, it also, it also states that if there's, if there's a usage, a reduction in the amount of usage for the laundry, then they're not going to pay you the full 4,500. And we had buildings that let's say, you know, 4,500 a month is a lot of money to, to not get the full amount to only get a thousand a month of that, and then have that shortfall every month, um, because the you know the laundry contract's not paying that. Um, that's something you need to take into consideration when you're budgeting as well. And that's kind of like that working document. If that money's not coming in, where is it coming? Looking at it later in the year, kind of finding it there. Um, and then it, that's leases, interest income. Uh, I always just like to point this out because obviously the market is not as, as doing as hot as it did in 2020. Um, I'm sorry, in 2021. Um, but we do because we do have buildings that will have significant re reserve funds um, and getting significant interest income. And if they're and if they're a more of a riskier building, which I get not not my way of doing it, because we said not for profit, right? We don't want to put the money at, at risk. If you're in the market and you're and you have good you know good gains, unrealized gains from from whatever securities you have the invested, that shouldn't be that shouldn't plug your operating budget. Right, that should all be part of your reserve. And I've seen buildings not do an increase uh, that they needed to do because they had a hundred thousand dollars of interest income. 
that's that's you know that's a that's you're using reserves and that's not i don't think that's the appropriate way to to budget for that um and then lastly the maintenance charges um again that's like i said your plug but you also have to take into consideration there as well uh re receivables accounts receivable because you have uh just like you have for commercial tenants right so that's a bigger piece so let's say 20 percent. what if you're a small building what if you're 25 units 30 units even if you are a 50 unit building you have one or two or three or even five people that aren't paying consistently and you're budgeting you're budgeting yeah you're expecting to get that money and you might and the truth is the truth of the matter is you might you know that the building the unit went to foreclosure there's no there's no lien the co-op the co-op especially in a co-op you're the lien holder you're going to get all the money at closing that's fine but if you know that there's a big mortgage on that property it's a condo you're not first in the line from the bank and you're gonna you're maybe going to get six months of common charges don't budget for the entire amount of maintenance and common charges because then that's again putting yourself in the position where you know you're gonna you're gonna end up being short and you're gonna again having that deficit so when you're looking at all the types of revenues just take into consideration the vacancies uh, the, the abatements, the provisions, and interest income should not be used to, to balance those budgets either. So that's that's a revenue side. That's helpful. Do you advise boards? Because I know that a lot of people have lost that stream of income, you know, potentially from commercial, condo, what have you. And they're also, you know, potentially a smaller building and they never had an increase in maintenance or they've had very small increases in maintenance and that's kind of what makes them that type of building you know they're proud of the fact right, they haven't true. had that how do you right. advise boards to build their revenue streams with so with minimal tools i don't know if that's a, a difficult question it's, but it's a, i mean about. it's 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 a it's a kind of uh wake up you know wake, wake up and see what's going on around you um type you know i i've again been doing this not for as long as I'm some of my competitors, but you know, I've been doing this for you know looking at budgets and, and financial statements for you know 12, 13 years. And and that that that's a that question is is like you know there's such pride. There's like such a, we have an increased maintenance in, in in 12, you know, 10 years, five years, six years, whatever it is, or you know, you know, the building next door is this and that you gotta that's something that you can't really factor into what you're doing. Because in the end of the day, yes, you're not increasing maintenance. You're you're, you're the best board. You're you know you're doing what's what's good for, what you think is good for the building. But if you're if you're losing fifty thousand dollars a year, and you're pulling out of the reserve account, then you're gonna have to answer the question. Let's say in three years from now, when you have to do a two hundred thousand dollar project, where is our money? Oh, we we haven't increased maintenance. We've been eating out of the reserve account. Well, what? How is that? How is that? Uh, you know a a block. You know. Um, dealing with your fiduciary responsibility as a board member to make sure you're managing the, the cash flow. And yes, it's, you know, that's always a nice thing, like you say, Lise. And, and I know, and I always get it also, you know, the, you know, if we increase maintenance more per square foot, then we're not going to sell and the brokers, are, I, I get all that. It's all real. That's all real, right? That's real life. Um, but, but real life also is the fact that if, if they have like an accountant or, 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 or a prudent lawyer looking at the financial statements of the building before the sale, they'll say, yeah, the maintenance is low, but look at the financial statements. They have no cash. They're running a deficit year after year. Um, they assess for everything. They have, you know, do you really want to move into a building like that? So kind of, you gotta, you gotta be smart. And then, like we said at the beginning, that forward looking approach, don't, you know, don't do that to yourself and don't do that to the building. Yeah, I mean, as a former broker, I definitely resonate with everything you said. And, you know, right. there is the pride elements of low maintenance and all that. And I, you know, it's, we try to educate buyers, but to the same point, with more local laws coming and then more expenses for buildings, like you just have to be methodical and you can't, it's not just the, that dollar, I guess, at the end of the day, you have what you're saying is the correct approach. Um, great. So can we chat about capital plan? Kind of just what we're talking about right now. Um, yeah, sure. And I did, did just want to add that um, I had a, one of my good friends had asked me to take a look at financials when she was looking to buy into a condo. And she said they were bragging about not having an increase for 10 years. My immediate thought was, well, look out, you'll probably either have one or they've been overcharging for 10 years. So, you know, because in, costs go up every year. So little increases um, seem to match the expenses are, are, is really probably the way to go when, when planning out um, over the course of time. Um, part, of, part of putting the, the budget together, um, I'd recommend taking a forward look at your 
your big ticket items, uh, your capital planning, um, doing you know what's going to come be coming up in the next five years, and maybe what's going to be coming up in the next 10, 15 years. You, you know, if you have if it's a co-op and you have a mortgage, you want to see if you can plan your refinances um, according to what your needs are going to be. So you really want to take a good look at those multi-year items, um, having a timeline with when those uh, useful lives are going to come up. Um, putting together wish lists of what items would be good to have, what items are necessity. So those are two key components when trying to put together the more non-recurring or um, extraordinary items, um, which a large number of people call capital planning. Um, that would be part of our budgeting process as well. Yeah, I know you work alongside Chris Alker on occasion in reviewing the five-year capital budget study, and that's really why you do it. We do. We actually use um, his study to to help put together the the planning with our boards. Um, whether they are going to try and build in a little increase every. Let's say you have a roof that you think might go in the next five to ten years. Well, it's awfully difficult to come up with that large number unless you're going to borrow or assess everybody right away. Unless you plan ahead. So planning ahead is certainly key. Um, perhaps doing an extra amount in the budget, a line item, uh, reserve replacement line item, things like that, that will help for, for future to, to defray big, large surprises. Mm -hmm. I think that's something most boards want to avoid is uh, the big, large surprises to their constituents, so. Definitely. Um, what are some considerations for refinancing, Avi? Yeah, of course. No, I, I, I think, you know, Megan hit it on, hit it on the head there, which is the, you know, I, I, I think of the boards when she, when she says that, I think of the boards where they consistently talk about at the annual meeting, we have, we want to do the elevator. We want to do the elevator every year. We want to do the elevator. We want, we know we have to do the root and they, and it's literally, you think you sit there like, this is like the same speech last year's annual meeting, but you know what, what they're doing is they're, you know, ingraining in everyone's heads, this is coming and this is how we're planning for it. And I have, you know, I had a board member has been, has been consistently every, every three, four months reaching out. He, they want to do, they want to do their elevator and they don't want to, and they don't want to assess and they don't want to, how, how are we doing it? Can we do it over five years? Should we do it over six years? Should we, should we take a draw on the line of credit? Should we not draw on the line of credit? These are the things that are, I like, those are good conversations because that means you're thinking ahead, um, you know, the, because of New York city creates this with the local law 11 programs you were mentioning before the five-year, you know, cycles for FISP. Um, <clears throat> so that's, you know, that is in, in grant. I, if you're not, if you're up for refi, which again, I, I know there was a lot of buildings. If we were talking last year, I would say, just do it, you know, take out as much as you can. The rates are low. I know they've climbed up a little bit, but I, I don't think it's, you know, I don't think it's, it's just more than it was, but I still think that's, you know, financing is, is the best way to go um, to do that. But when you're looking at it, you really need to say to yourself, either you ask your managing agent, ask your, you know, ask your accountant, ask the rest of the board, what do we have? Look at, look at, look at the last 10, 15 years of capital projects and say, you know, we did, we know we did the elevator, we did the roof, we did the boiler, we did the sidewalk walls or whatever it may be. We did the terraces if we have terraces. Okay, so we don't have those to do, but we want to do that. We want to do this. And, and then the necessity versus wanting to do a lobby renovation or a hallway renovation, you know, those are those are expensive propositions that obviously brings value to the building. Um, but that's, you know, that, that may not take precedence over something else. Um, so when it comes to refinancing or taking out a line of credit as, as the bullet line item there says, I look at the line of credit more as, as a, as a, uh, emergency fund, uh, because of a lot of the lines of credits have variable interest rates. They're not locked in like it is with a mortgage. Um, you know, we've had, like I guess if you have to use them, you have to use them. If you want to set up a plan similar to the way con uh, condominiums are, are, uh, this has been more of a common theme. I think, I don't know if we talked, I think we spoke about it last year, um, where, the the new approach with condominiums is they don't want to assess let's say a million dollars within a, a year they'll go and take out a loan and and set up an assessment equal to the loan so it's everyone's taking it's like the building's taking out individual mortgages for everyone in the building and to and to pay and to pay down the mortgage obviously some people could afford to prepay some people some can't and they'll take it over 10 years uh that's the same way with the line of credit i don't you know i don't 
want, I wouldn't view the line of credit as, as a means unless you didn't plan appropriately, or there's a, there's a, there's an emergency or something, you know, that you didn't plan for, um, that you thought was going to be okay, that you would have to take out. So, uh, that's really, you know, that's really how you should look at it to me. Again, it's just an emergency fund. It's not like you, you should take it out. If you think you're going to need it, let's say you got a $5 million loan with a million dollar line of credit. And the goal is to draw on the, on the million dollar line of credit, get a $6 million loan and, and, you know, feed it into there. Cause that money again is set at that fixed rate for 10 years, normally in a co-op um, as opposed to in the line of credit where now, yeah, it's maybe four or 5%, but when you need it, it might be seven or 8%. And then you're going to, you're going to kick yourself. What about for buildings that have refinanced maybe two or three years ago and they're finding themselves still money strapped and, you know, how do, how do you help buildings like that? I know of some buildings just at the top of my head that are kind of in that position. Yeah, I do. I, I'm thinking of one in particular. Um, I don't know if it's Sigma. It might be. Thanks. No, I'm kidding. Probably not. <laughs> so uh, I've seen, I've seen, you have to run the numbers. And I think, you know, I'm sure Megan's done this analysis with boards. We, we run the numbers. Most, most, most uh, co-op mortgages will have, most commercial loans will have a prepayment penalty. So, which is usually disclosed in the financial statements. I know, I know at least we do in our, in our statements, um, where if you prepay the loan before a certain period, there's a, there is a, as a percentage premium or penalty that the bank is trying to recoup the interest they would have was supposed to receive. Um, yield maintenance or, or yield maintenance um, pre, prepayment penalties. I think I've kind of, phys- I don't, haven't seen any new loans with that prepayment penalty, which is a large hefty penalty. Uh, but some of them mostly will take, it'll be a percentage of the balance. So uh, let's say 5% in the first two years, you know, 4%, 3%, 2%, et cetera. Um, so it's running the numbers. What's, what makes more sense? Does it make more sense to go and take out a second mortgage, which is what some buildings do. They'll go and take out a second, uh, not, a, not, a line, not draw on the line of credit. They'll go take out another fixed second mortgage. Um, and fund it that way and have to, and then they'll have it coterminous that it will they'll mature at the same time as the first mortgage. Um, or the other option is saying, okay, maybe the pre- prepayment penalty is not so bad. It's only fifty thousand dollars. So let's go and just refinance the whole the whole loan. Obviously, you have to pay co- closing costs again. Um, but it might be the, the math might make more sense doing it that way as opposed to uh, assessing and 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 as you know because again, you just get to spread it out over a longer period of time. So those would be my recommendations. Yeah, if I, if I just want to add, it won't help quite as much possibly, but really keep an eye on, on, on expenses, cutting costs where you can, um, just making sure you're not overpaying. And, um, you know, like what Avi spoke about before, making sure you maximize on all your um, income, um, you know, keeping an eye on the leases, things like that, and, and any chargebacks that need to be done. So every little bit helps. Thank you. Helpful. I mean, it's tough. It's been a difficult past few years for a lot of buildings. So it's not unusual to unfortunately have that occurrence. Um, so let's chat about what is new and additional things to consider. So can you tell me a little bit about the wage climate, Megan, and what you're seeing? Sure. Yeah, this past year, well, this is more for New York City. Um, this past year, the 32BJ contract was renewed, um, which was sort of in line what had been done in the past years. So um, it, it was not a big surprise on the um, costs that are coming out of it. But in the meantime, um, there was the the um, curveball of prevailing wages that had come across um, this year. There was a lot of questioning, a lot of uh, recommending to speak to the your um, professionals, your auditors and your attorneys to get, um, you know, the um, appropriate recommendations on, on how to handle. Um, most of that seems to have settled down now, but basically the prevailing wage will um, pay your employees the same o- or equivalent amount that the union uh, workers are receiving. Um, if you do not comply with the prevailing wage, if you choose not to, the threat from New York City is that you will risk losing your abatement. Um, so there's certain eligibility on 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 that. There's you know different um, unit count and assessed values that that may uh, preclude you from having to follow these rules. But uh, it really has thrown a monkey wrench in um, some of the uh, wages uh, and and, and uh, planning ahead for those things. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, and what about current fuel and energy costs? How's that affecting, you know, the budget? Yeah, uh, we've seen, obviously, the, the oil costs have gone through the roof. Uh, we've seen anywhere from double and triple from different suppliers. Um, it, it's really hurt some of our buildings pretty badly this past uh, heating season. So there, there are a handful of buildings I know of that um, are considering uh, heat assess uh, fuel assessments to catch up with the hope that um, instead of permanently including it in maintenance, that it might be a temporary situation that if the price per gallon can go back to 250 a gallon, as opposed to $5 a gallon, um, that that might not be a permanent increase in the carrying costs for, for each of the buildings. So, and that's, and that's a perfect example sort of kind mm -hmm. of, of the working document, right? You have a building that at a, you know, $400,000 budget for energy and you, and you blew through 75% of it in the first four months of the year, you have two options. You have what Megan said, which is do something about it or just, all right, so we have 25% left to get us to the next 10, you know, the next eight months and do nothing about it. And hopefully we'll have somewhere else along the way that we'll get savings. That's a, it's a perfect example of that working document. Yeah. Sorry. I let you go back. to. No, yeah. that, that, that's about, that's true. pretty much on the, on the mark right there. And, um, and the same thing know. can be said for supply chain issues. And now everyone's, you know, worried about inflation and, you know, in order to prepare a budget, I guess you have to have that third sense of what's going to potentially go on in the world. So how do you work with boards regarding that? You, you know, I don't know if there's a set percentage that um, supplies have gone up, but we've definitely seen a little bit of an uptick. Um, and it's just planning ahead and, and perhaps putting in contingencies for some of these items. Um, you may not be able to hold the line on your, you know, supply uh, category for the next year. We might have to bump up, you know, a bit just to be realistic. I, th I think that's part of the whole budget process is being realistic and um, and, and transparency with the, you know, the owners. It's nobody likes an increase for sure. But being transparent and saying, obviously, fuel has gone up. We're not seeing it go back down, although we are. We actually are seeing a little bit of a decline in the fuel prices now. But you know, just making sure we're completely transparent on all of the items that have gone up. Um, owners are are smart. They're realistic. They know if if we're honest with everybody and tell them why their maintenance or common charges are going up, they would they'll understand if we if you break it out. So I think just being you know open with everybody on on the figures is important. Yeah, that makes sense, and I think certain items, you know, that a building doesn't know that's going, I mean, the average resident doesn't always know what the board is spending their money on, you know, they don't know necessarily that a boiler broke, as an example, maybe they do. But, you know, I think to your point, understanding the building's workings from a resident, not just board perspective is very helpful. So you know where your money is going. I remember we had a conversation, you were saying like, in sometimes in the budget and at least in the description, you know, you show like the top line items so that, you know, it resonates with everyone, not just the board. Yeah. And it, it is funny because once you dig into some of it, I think it's interesting. I had never known that um, garbage bags are a petroleum based product. So something like that, when a fuel price goes up there, garbage bags are going to go up. So it, it is interesting to see, you know, what, one price increase has an effect on others. Speaking of increases, um, the primary interest rates expenses have increased and the same thing we said for, I guess, the co-ops that have refinanced. So as of July 22, the rate is 5.5%. What are you doing with boards to help them make that consideration? It's an Avi or Megan question. Well, I think that goes, <laughs> I think that goes back to what I was saying about the line of credit because a lot of the... The, if you read it, uh, I mean, I, I, we read in a lot of the closing statements for the refinancing, the building, the line of credit is variable based on the prime rate, right? So, um, <clears throat> if you're, you know, you're considering to draw on line of credit half a million dollars and when the prime rate was three point two five, okay, now it's at you know five point five as as a floor. Um, so that's you know that that has that's consideration there, and you know the the it's something to consider when you're drawing on. It. Obviously, if you really drew on it. 
you know, that's, that's something you have to budget for. Uh, that's not going to be a fixed monthly amount like you have with your mortgage. Uh, you may want to consider uh, implementing some plan. We have boards, we have, we have, uh, we have boards that will use, um, they've, they've drawn on the line of credit, but they'll use flip taxes for say life, a policy for the next couple of years. All of our flip taxes will go to cover draw, you know, paying down our line of credit, um, so this way, you know, the, we save on the interest rates there. Some boards will say, no, it's not, you know, it's not too much. We, we'll just pay for it. It's part of maintenance, et cetera. Uh, it depends how much you've drawn. Um, but uh, that is that is something that if you have a balance, you know, there's a 2% two, 2 increase on that prime rate could affect you how much, whatever your balance in the line of credit. So make sure that that is factored into uh, what you're doing it. And it's not the same. It won't be the same as last year. Uh, so that's important. Yep. And just and and I don't know if Megan, you want to point on that. I just had one more point on the prevailing wages, um, you know, because I think Megan mentioned this about the the what 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 you qualify, you know, for the qualifications for having to pay prevailing wages. We had a just I had a couple two instances in both directions over the last couple of months. One where I was talking to a board and say, oh yeah, you know, we're going to have to give up the abatement, and I said, why? They said, well, because you have to this new rule. I said, but you're under the valuation. Of sixty thousand, uh, the average, the average, average assessed value of sixty thousand per unit, and so you're not, you don't, you don't qualify. You don't, you're not required. I mean, to to pay prevailing wage, and it was like, oh, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know that, and they were ready, like they were ready in, in their minds to get rid of this hundred thousand dollar abatement uh, when they didn't, I guess, they didn't realize that. I think that's more again that sixty thousand is a low number. It was this was a Brooklyn building, so. Uh, outer boroughs probably should, you know, consider that. Um, and the other, the other side, the flip side of it was we had a building that signed an affidavit fully in, they fully believed that they were paying the prevailing wages based on like ancillary vacation days and other things they had, but they were so off. I mean, like they were like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars off, so they, they were going to. Were an building, right? They it wasn't an. A, no, no, <laughs> no, it wasn't I'm an eight sure. building. No, no. No, not, none of those. No, none of those. None of those. Only the I good examples. Only the good that, examples. But, you know. Only the good examples. So um, uh, they, uh, what do they do? Oh, so they were off by one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. They would have to increase wages by one hundred and fifty, but the abatements that they were getting for a couple of unit owners were only fifty thousand dollars. So obviously the math there makes sense. So they were able. The point I want, I'm trying to make here, is that they were able to rescind the affidavit because that was that's part of being uh you know requiring yourself i mean um to qualify for the pre to, for the abatement is you have to sign this piece of paper that says that you pay prevailing wages they were able to rescind that so if you're building that maybe assigned it and are going forward with the abatement but maybe have second thoughts or you did the math later on and realized it really doesn't make sense uh you have that ability to call in new york city and say i i take back my affidavit and i don't you know i'm, I'm willing to forego that because um again that's just you know, I, we don't know what necessarily how they're, the city is going to audit this. I, you know, it's, that's the question we get a lot of. Well, how are they going to know for paying prevailing wages? I and so the answer is I assume they're going to spot check buildings and look at your payrolls and uh, or they, they, they. I mean, New York, New York City, New York State has access. I mean, obviously, if you're if you're filing W two a, a New York State, New York City forms, they have some information to know, so they could they could look there. But we don't know what. You know how they're going to do this, and it's it's not necessarily worth the risk, especially if it's not benefiting a lot of people in the building. Yeah, I was going to ask, what about for buildings that don't necessarily qualify for the abatement issues, like today, like might fall under four twenty one a, but eventually. Yeah, it's it's a it's a big question. I I haven't heard from I I heard I, I heard from someone again. It was all speculative. I don't think it, I don't think there's any. It doesn't say this in anywhere from New York City that if you gave up the abatement, you may not be able to get it back, or that you know that these programs won't be. It's a, it's a kind that of your grand your grandfather did, and that's it. You can't. I don't know. I mean, it's also very possible. The, the the flip side of this, it's very very possible. And this was something buildings weighed when I was talking to boards. Is well, what happens if they get rid of the abatement program in two years? Right. So, you know, you just increase your payroll cost 10 percent, 15 percent to get to, to prevailing wages for your employees. But again, I'm not saying is a is a is, is a good thing if that's if that's if that's, you know, you, you obviously value the people that are taking care of your building and that's what you want to be able to pay them. But, you know, you just increase 15 percent to keep the abatement and they get rid of the abatement program. What are you going to do? You're going to go you're going to go back to your employees and say, you know what, now we don't we don't have to do it. So we're going to take you know, we're going to bring you back to where you were before. Obviously, you're not going to do that. So that was something that a lot of boards were taking into consideration, which which is that 
is what happens. But no one knows. I mean, they've been talking about the abatement getting uh, canceled or, or not renewed for, for many years, the last many years, last 10 years. Uh, but it was something that, you know, to people were taking into consideration when they were doing that uh, analysis. Yeah, it's definitely a challenge to figure out what the right move is at any yeah. given time, because again, everything is subject to change, and that's the difficulty Correct. here. Correct. Um, so speaking of best practices, what are some best practices that we can do as we move forward? So I guess either or Megan? Yeah, I would just recommend working with your budgeting team to to start early um, on your budget process. Make sure you review the whole year. Uh, make sure you understand all of your expenses. Have your professionals um, go through it with you. Um, it's it's not high level math or anything, so it really is something that anybody um, can can understand. You know, I, I, just planning ahead is is important. You want to be able to tell uh, your owners. Um, what your plan is, uh, if, they, if they're having an increase or an assessment, that kind of thing. You know, being transparent again. Right, and the, and the key, and the key to that, you starting early. I mean, you know, I know, ACAMs on their, you know, a lot of the agents, their budget season starts early. You get, you want to make sure that if there's a, any iterations of the budget, you want to make sure that that gets implemented January one. If you're fiscal, you know, fiscal year building. I mean, I'm sorry, calendar year building. You want to make sure that January one, you you know, are we increasing two percent, three percent, five percent, or no increase? Uh, we you know, a lot of times I'll sit down in January with a board. Uh, oh, we're looking at the budget now, and it's like, you know, well now 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 you lost January, and potentially you're gonna lose February, and it'll do an increase in March. So you have the option then. Well now, so now we lost two months of increase. So do we go and retro everybody, or do we just start from here? And it's not really giving the whole year. So you, you're giving yourself the opportunity to start early talk to your professionals. Um, and also, I mean, just to be fair, also your, your management company spends a lot of time. If you, you, you look at, if you're an ACAM client on this webinar and, you, or, you know, a lot of these, a lot of, ma a lot of managing agents use there's a 25 page document that you're looking at. And uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of information that goes in there. Um, take the time to go through it because it, it, it is all broken down for you into different pieces. Um, and like Megan said, it's not, it's not, it's not, uh, you know, it's not calculus. It's not, uh, you know, it's not a college level course. It's uh, it's like budgeting for yourself. And uh, if you look, and if you look, take that approach and realize it's not that difficult and understand what you're looking at, um, you know, you'll be able to tackle it and, and, and focus in on the important parts, important pieces going, you know, going forward. Yeah. And I think, I think, you know, our last item here with reviewing it throughout the year, it does set a, a map for the whole year of comparing where you thought you'd be versus where you've come in actually. Um, you want to make sure your your budget is weighted for seasonality. So the fuel expenses, obviously, any heating expenses would be in the heating season. Um, if you have landscaping and uh, relief work during the summer, you want to make sure those items are weighted for for those periods, so that you have a realistic look at what's going on. Um, you know, actual versus budget throughout the year. Yeah, those pa those pages on the man on the monthly report. As are the are the most important pages to look at and you know mm -hmm. that and you could see where the variances are and and, and, ask, and raise your hand and say how come there's a thirty thousand dollar variance at you know at your board meeting in in, in may why is there a thirty thousand dollar variance in this account and the answer might be very simply well this you know unit 1a is not paying their maintenance so therefore that's why you know we're short or we had a we had a gas leak or we had not a gas leak we had a, a you know whatever some some repair there as well um, and, uh, the other, the other important page to look at while you're looking at this each year is also payables, right? So there's, I, I always love to give this example because it just, it's just so outrageous how this, how it got there is that, you know, we took over a building and, um, you know, we were doing the audit and I, and I noticed that they had a $250,000 of unpaid bills. And I, you know, so I called the board member and I knew new, new client, obviously. Right. So I'm trying not to you know, be the very bad news, but I said, do you know that you have all these unpaid bills? Cause I went back and looked at the previous manager reports and he said, and it was all there, you know, for months and he said, I had no idea. 
you know, and uh, we sat in a room, we had to sit in a room at the managing agent's office, obviously not an ACAM building, never, never have an ACAM building. And, uh, and it was, there was actually someone on the board was, it was a, was a CPA and he, and, and, and they looked at me and they said, well, you know, should, you know, tell the board, tell the rest of my colleagues on the board that this was there in front of their noses this entire time that they should have looked at it. And again, not to not not to add more work to board members. That's obviously a volunteer position. Focus on, you know, one or two things in that monthly report to always look at, whether it's receivables, whether it's the actual versus budget, which is unpaid bills. And uh, I get a I get a I get a call from a, another client of mine also every month. Why are my unpaid? Why are we still? Why do we still have unpaid bills? What's going on? Why aren't we paying our bills? Can you help me? What's you know? They say they don't have money. That means you're you're looking at it. And it's not growing, and you're and you're engaging with with the report that you're getting every month. And um, because again, if you if you don't take into account the payables, and you do, let's say Megan does a forecast of those of your expenses, and okay, you'll cover all your expenses for the year because maintenance is X, you know, versus expenses of Y. Well, we still have a hundred thousand of expenses that we haven't paid from the year before because we were short cash because the commercial owner, I don't know, didn't pay two months or whatever it was. Those are the things that are are important to look to look into as well. Is those you know what's sitting in the, what's sitting in the closet that we don't know about? That yeah, we're fine going forward. Everything's fine, but we have things that are there before. So I think kind of that again that that kind of you know wraps it all together. That working model approach. It's not just now in October and sending out a letter to the owners. It's continuously looking at it, seeing what's what's on the report each month. Talk to your accountant, talk to your board, to your your analyst or your or your financial person, wherever it is, and say, you know, help me help me through the the management report. Help me understand what I'm looking at, um, so this way we don't get into the situation, or, or we understand what we're looking at. So that would be you know, my takeaway from it. Great. I mean, it's just it's hard, but it, you can't kick it. You know, you have to pay those bills eventually. They're going to creep up on you. Yeah. Um, so we're going to open this now up to Q&A portion. Um, I did receive a few questions in between um, while you both were speaking. Um, and of course, like always, if we didn't touch upon the particular topic you wanted us to cover or you any questions that you have, please let us know and we will respond to you. Um, so first, what are restricted funds? Oh, this is, a, this is always a goodie. It's, um, I'll take this one first. Let me get a few if, if you're okay. With that, um, restricted funds. So restricted funds are um, not funds that, not a misnomer that it's not funds you can't use. It's more that's restricted for a purpose. So we want to make sure that, the, especially when financial statements are prepared from a gap perspective, from accounting standards, um, if you collected a, an assessment for $500,000 today, let's say that, that, that client we were talking about with the elevator, he's been talking about the elevator for three years. They've been, let's say they've been assessing a hundred thousand a year for this elevator. So they've collected $300,000 already. That money is restricted for what? For the elevator project, because that's what they told everybody, right? If I, that you got to make sure it's in the right. So that's what restricted funds are, is they're funds that were, were communicated to the, to the owners of the building for a specific purpose or budgeted, let's say in a condo where you have, let's say 10% of maintenance, a common charge is being set aside for capital projects. That's that's for capital projects, and that's uh, that's not to be used for, you know, to pay your water and sewer bill or to pay for the commercial unit owner. That's not being. I mean, listen, you may you may have to, uh, but you have to kind of set up a payback to yourself, a loan payback um, to the reserve to restricted account to pay for that. So that and that's different from regular reserves. Re regular reserves is like it's just rainy day funds. Uh, which are not really restricted for any purpose. So that's that's what restricted is restricted for a purpose and shouldn't and shouldn't be used for others. Thank you. Very helpful. Um, okay. Do you assess capital planning or build it up over time? That, that that's a good question. I'll start, and Avi, feel free to chime in. Uh, th there's almost two different philosophies. One is to assess for the project when it comes up. The other is to build up over time. Um, to build towards that. My, my personal feeling is that I think it's more fair to build up over time, either through reserve replenishment line. Um, you know, I'll give the example of a new owner. Is it fair to them to have to pay a $50,000 assessment the first month they move in because the, the roof has to be replaced? 
On the flip side, is it fair to elite, uh, an owner departing who on their last month there has to hit a $50,000 assessment because of the roof that's been um, built up over time? So I, my personal feeling is to try and plan ahead and either do a combination of the two, two items or um, set aside the money little by little and just really plan ahead. But Avi, feel free to no, it's a, those are the two approaches, and and we have and I have we have buildings that uh, the other example is a building that um, maintains no reserve. They don't they only assess. That's their that's their policy, and and listen, it work if it works for the building, that's the that's you know, the usually they're smaller buildings, and and that's uh, you know everybody the boards know each other, everyone in the building knows each other. They all know their financial positions, and that's what they said. I'll manage my own cash on my own. Um, and when you need money, I'll give, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, will assess me and I'll pay for it. Um, and, uh, but again, that's, that's really the exception. I mean, out of 200 buildings, I think we have one or two that do that. Um, so yeah, the other, the other option, you know, just like Megan said, you really want to just kind of have foresight to either build up or, you know, build it up because that just is helpful to everybody around because you don't know everybody's financial position. Yeah. That situation. What is your, do you have a preference on um, increased in maintenance or assessments for buildings that are definitely monitoring their sales price, let's say? What was the question again? Sorry, I missed it. Oh, that's okay. I, you know, I, as a former broker, as an example, you know, you don't want to see a huge increase in maintenance. Like it, it might, but you also, you know, assessments that are ongoing forever also carry right. to a potential buyer. So do you, right. how do you navigate that? Well, I think it, when assessments that go on forever are really just maintenance increase that they're called they're called assessments, um, and they're not they're just they're kind of masked in that way. Um, I mean, navigating it, it's it's I've we I've worked with boards that will won't utter the word assessment because it's 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 not allowed. It's a bad word. I mean, we we charge back, you know, for things. Uh, but in the end of the day, it's all it's all it's it's really coming from the same place. So you really have to figure out. What is your assessment for? If your assessment's for capital, then that then that is the right thing to do. You're assessing, let's say, five percent of maintenance every year and setting that money aside for a project like we were just talking about. If you're assessing for operating, then yes, you could you could do you know what Megan was saying the fuel search. Let's say for fuel sur surcharges, um, but if you realize you've been assessing that same assessment for the last three years and it's not going away, that really is just an increase in maintenance and you're just calling it an assessment. Uh, so it's, it's, you got to be true, true to the word of what it's for. Uh, a non-capital assessment is to plug a gap, a temporary gap. A long drawn out operating assessment is just, uh, is just an op, is just a, is a common charge increase or maintenance increase that's being hidden as an assessment. Because again, if you're, you know, at least if you're the shareholder, you're still paying the same. Instead, you know, you're it's saying you have two line. I'm saying a thousand dollars maintenance and two hundred and fifty dollars of assessment. You're still paying twelve fifty, no matter how much you swing. True, but I think from a sales perspective, when you're selling it, you don't necessarily know about the assessment. It's not on Street Easy. Is that true? Is that true? It's is not. That, no, it's not. No. A, oh, okay. But so, I see. I I've been questioned. Like I've been, the catch. Right. I see. So that so that so I've been questioned by potential buyers about assessments. When is the assessment ending, or why why is there an assessment? Um, but maybe that's more that's maybe that's maybe that's more of a sophisticated buyer that's looking into it further than what you know maybe um, than than what's on streeties or whatever yeah, is I out mean, there. It's, yeah, it's almost easier to have an assessment from a. I mean, it's not good either way, but, you know, at least if you, it's better from, I think, a purchaser's perspective to see a lower monthly because you think, oh, well, the assessment will eventually run out. Right. You know, as yeah, but, yeah, but some high right. for eternity, you think you're strapped in. Right. Yeah. If it has an end date or a specific purpose. Right. If it's, that's what I'm saying. If it's a capital assessment, it'll probably will end. Right. Um, yeah. If it's, if it's a, if it's an operating assessment, it should end. If it doesn't, then that's really just an increase in maintenance. Right. And I do believe Fannie Mae, yeah, I do believe Fannie Mae requirements also are going to ask about assessments now um, for, the, for those loans backed by Fannie Mae. They, they will be asking what is the purpose of the assessment and how long. Got it. Well, that's also going to be, I guess, to have an impact. Um, but similarly, what about flip taxes versus like reserve buildings? Well, if you if you 
it, well, I guess the question is the question, um, should, a, bu- if, should, should a, building a building have a flip tax? Have, I mean, we hear that all yeah. the time. Yeah. I mean, Sh- should they, you know, yeah. I'm, I probably get shot for it, answering this, but you know, uh, some of my, some of our clients are adamantly against it. Um, you have to see what the, you know, you have to see what it's going to generate for the building, but yes, the it sh- flip taxes should be something that's used in conjunction with, with, with result, re- the result reserve building for the mm-hmm. main purposes, ma- main reason of, if you're a building that doesn't generate a lot of turnover every year, then you can't rely on that to build up your reserve. Um, or if you're building, some buildings have this uh, flip tax calculation where it's based on profit. So you have you're someone that's been there for 40 years, they're going to pay 2% of the profit. It could be a hefty flip tax, especially for New York City property. Um, but then you have a guy a guy or girl that just bought two years ago and they're either losing money or, or it's a nominal profit. They're not going to get the same flip tax. So, you, you know, you're going to get $200,000 from one guy and you're going to get you know, five thousand for somebody else. It's that's hard. That's hard if you're trying to get to a goal on a capital on a capital project. It's not. Um, it's not helpful. It could, could, could stagger you. Um, so, um, so if you if you, I'm not going to tackle whether you should or shouldn't. I'm, I'm assuming it's just question whether flip tax or reserves. I think it should work. To, they should work together uh, to get to your goal. Um, if you have a good, uh, some of the bigger buildings have a consistent turnover. Then I think that's um, then yeah, I think you you have a better benchmark of how to you know to, oh, you know to kind of look at it. Oh, we've averaged about one hundred fifty thousand of flip tax income over the last five years. All right, so we need we need another three fifty a year in assessments or allocations in the budget to get us to where we need to be for capital planning. Um, I think that is that's that's a that's a good approach, but not I wouldn't rely on it one way or you know just completely one way or the other. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, what kind of capital, working capital funds should you be carrying? It, the rule of thumb has been um, three to six months of carrying costs. So that would be, you know, three to six months worth of, of what your um, monthly income is. I, I do think some of that is changing a bit, though, with people doing a better deep dive on, on the, you know, the planning we spoke about with the major capital items, facilities um, being reviewed, what you need to do. So um, yeah, sort of looking at both those items and making sure you do have enough for future and um, enough base funding um, for people to be able to get loans. Because lenders will be looking at, at, at the audited financials to make sure that there's um, a, a, yep. an amount there. Um, I, I agree. Harry. I agree. Great, thank you guys. And we will finish our financial happy hour with the last question. And we of course encourage more after we're done tonight, but is locking in direct energy suppliers beneficial anymore? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, My understanding is you're either paying on indexing which floats with the market or a fixed pricing. Um, When you're using the um, indexing, it's you know just based on what the current market is, but the fixed pricing will be locked in um, with a premium for the duration of the contract. So it might be uh, e- easier to budget what you will be paying out, but you might not end up getting the best price for it. So I would absolutely recommend talking to an energy expert that can help balance what the goal is of, of, of locking into those rates if, if that's something you're interested in for sure. So there's no specific like percentage you should put aside these days? Um, on the energy suppliers? Yeah, um, that you should expect for common. No, I think it's really just looking at what the what the goal is and, um, you know. You don't want you don't want to lock yourself into, you don't want to lock yourself into something that, you know, in a higher market, um, uh, I, I get it, it's, 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 it's a gamble. It's a gamble <laughs> one way or the other, but. Um, I think, well, you know, obviously I, I'm, I'm not an energy expert, but I've seen from buildings just an experience, the ones that do lock in, I think over the, over the period of however long they'll lock in for usually will win um, or come out ahead as opposed to those that don't. Um, the problem is, is that I've, I've seen from, and I think, you know, Megan's always, you know, informed me about this because like we're not, as the auditors, we're not, we don't get involved in the contracts to do this, uh, but a lot of times it'll, it'll expire. 
and no one does anything about it. And then it just it blows, it blows up in your face. And, and it's like, and, and kind of managing the contract each year or, or the lock, however you're locking it in and making sure that once it's over, you kind of move into a new lock and not letting it expire is probably the, or finding out, I mean, finding out if any, you know, finding out, do you have a lock? Um, and when does it expire is probably the, the best question you want to ask yourself now. And if we don't, should we like, like Megan was saying, talking to uh, one of these, you know, suppliers like direct energy or um, uh, Plymouth or, I don't know, I'm, trying, I'm forgetting who they are, but they're out there and uh, and they'll help you. Thank you. That's great. Well, both of you have been fantastic. Thank you so much, Avi and Megan, for your time. And thank you all for your time. And thank you for participating. Um, we loved having you and have a great night. Happy end of summer. See ya. Thank you, Lise. Bye. Thank have you. Have a great night. You too. Bye-bye.